be speaking on the uh, second part of the sermon series that we started last Sunday, uh, The Way of Disciples. Uh, last Sunday, we uh, touched on uh, John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 4, calling our first disciples and uh, distinguished the difference between followers of Jesus, the difference between spectators and seekers and the disciples. And, uh, and we uh, concluded that uh, Jesus calls us, uh, each one of us, to be disciples of Jesus, and following uh, Jesus in uh, restoring God's kingdom on this earth. So that was last Sunday. So, uh, what was the title last Sunday? I forgot. <laughs> Anybody know? Just follow. All right, so, so this Sunday is the second part, the second movement in, uh, uh, in the way of disciples, and we will be uh, uh, speaking on two different parts from the Bible, from the book of uh, Micah, and also from a briefly touching on the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, the Beatitudes, a quite well-known passage. Uh, I'll be just briefly touching on that later today, which... I wouldn't mind to do some sort of mini-series on that, but not today. Uh, we'll, do, we'll just touch on that today. Uh, and today's title is Do What God Requires of Us. It's about practice of disciples. So about 20 years ago, at the dawn of a new decade, a new century, a brand new uh, TV show captured people's attention worldwide, and the TV watching has never been the same. Survival. Remember that, folks? Survival. Remember that? So it's the first and arguably the most successful and longest running reality TV shows, followed by uh, American Idol, The Bachelor, The Real Housewives, The Brothers, Apprentice, just to name a few. Uh, the beginning of new era on TV watching. After 20 years, now the reality shows are going stronger than ever all around the world. The new ones just came out. I don't know uh, any of you watch this, but I haven't watched any of this, but I just pulled out the list. Temptation Island. Anybody seen that? <laughs> <laughs> Dating Around. Mexican Dynasties, uh, Dynasties and The Masked Singers. That's a good one to watch. Uh, yeah. In, in, in Korea, uh, the reality shows are as popular as K pops and K dramas. Anybody watch K pop? K dramas? Oh, yeah. You should if you go through. So, my wife Sue, uh, she's not here this morning. Uh, uh, she's uh, hooked uh, with a Korean reality show about super cute kids aged between two to five growing up. She's prepping for her being a grandparent. So I guess. <laughs> She, well, she's at home right now because she has a cold, uh, so she doesn't want to spread a germ today, so she's staying home. I think she's watching that at this point. <laughs> so my question is, do any of you actually follow the reality shows at all? No? Well, there are quite a few, quite a few on cable, but also on the internet and YouTube. There are a variety of reality shows out there. So if, if you were to pick, I know you don't follow, but if you were to pick uh, what your favorite reality TV shows, what would that be? I mean, I used to watch American Idol, uh, like you know, Survival and Apprentice, and Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, I used to watch some of them. Not anymore. I haven't watched TV for a while. But anyway, many people are still tuned in to reality shows in fact, more than 7 million people viewed the last episode of the reality TV show last year, uh, Bachelor, uh, last year. Now, what's our obsession with these reality shows on TV or on internet? Now, most reality shows are not about talented and successful people, except very few. There are hundreds of reality shows that are about people who have serious life issues, right? Uh, serious breakdowns in their lives. People who one way or the other are struggling with extreme case of troubles 
in their lives. So that's why there are some shows like Intervention, you've seen that one, books like Extreme Makeover, Temptation Island, once again, Dating Around, Predations, <laughs> right? the real American Housewives, are they real? I don't know, but you know, The Bachelor, The Big Brothers, The Biggest Losers, The Holders, right? Just name a few of them. Millions of people are tuning in every day and watching them struggle and suffer and often fail miserably. So what's our obsession with watching people struggle with such huge life issues? I mean, don't we have other things to do than watching and being entertained by people with extreme case of troubles? I mean, what's fun in that, right? Well, I have two theories for this obsession people have with reality TV shows. And we just want you to know that these theories that are just coming out are not scientifically proven, it's not scholarly reviewed or based on some nationwide people survey, it's just based on my own gut hunch. Okay, so I just want to let you know that. Theory number one, people like to watch other people struggle with issues because most of us share the same struggles. Maybe it has something to do with this sharing of universal human struggle, maybe not exactly the same size or shape of the struggles, but nevertheless, we as human beings all have our share of shortcomings, problems, and breakdowns in our lives. And we sympathize with these people. It's almost like we see ourselves in their place, our own struggle, and we wish them well for help. Right? So that's number one, uh, my theory number one. Theory number two. We watch them for that exact opposite reason. We are nothing like them at all. We see ourselves better than them. We are so different than them. Not so out of control, not so chaotic, not so bad. We're not as messy, overweight, out of control, repetitively addicted, not so broken. Compared to them, we are much better, much smarter, much healthier, good people. Watching them suffer makes us feel good about ourselves. We are on a different level. Watching people making fool out of themselves make us feel better. We laugh at them at their lack of talent. Remember uh, in American Idol a few years ago, William Hong? You know that. Remember that? Some of you too. And as long as we have someone to watch struggle, point finger at, laugh at, and even get angry at, as long as the ones who are struggling are out there, we will continue to watch from a distance, even obsessed by it. And what it does is that it, it distances us from our own fear of badness and brokenness and creates this false sense of security and goodness and for our own goodness, we need to have someone to point finger at and laugh at and even get angry at. We are better than them. Theory number two. Now, there's a line in fiction, uh, Garrison Taylor. I don't know anybody has, has read this fiction. I haven't, but I picked on this line. From, uh, it's the title called Late Woe Be Gone. Uh, uh, the little town proclaims that it's the place where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. <laughs> Maybe all of us who are obsessed with the reality TV shows have this case of late who be gone syndrome. How we feel about ourselves, that we are better than others. I'm not talking about you folks, I'm talking about yourself. Did you know the majority man, majority of men think that they are handsome? Did you know that? <laughs> I do that too. I wake up in the morning and go to the bathroom and look at myself in the mirror and often greet myself, hello handsome. <laughs> Don't you do that? <laughs> Did you know the majority of women think they are beautiful? 60% of students think they are in the top of 
We all tend to get through the day, we all get through life by believing that somehow we are significantly different, better, more worthy than those that surround us. We find comfort in overestimating ourselves. This self-deception keeps the world going around. Let me give you an example. Can we recall the last time you were on the road and some other driver traveled too close, pulled out too soon, parked too crooked, or drove too slow or fast to suit you? Is in our first response to mutter about what a crummy driver that other person is? Yes. In other words, we instantly elevate our own driving skills to some higher, less flawed plateau. Watch out for the other drivers, we say. In today's Hebrew text, we read that the prophet Micah was charged with confronting a similarly smug, self-satisfied, and self-elevated people of Israel. The people of God, the covenant community, the chosen people had fallen into the ways of sins and selfishness. But they had no idea how far they had fallen, had no sense of self-awareness. And not only that, they even felt angry, felt this righteous indignation toward God for not saving them soon. They were in a deep self-delusion. Foreign nations and empires were constantly threatening Israel from all sides, and God repeatedly warned them of their sinfulness through the prophets to repent and turn around. But over and over, they ignored the warnings and even confronted God with a defiant attitude. Why don't you save us? So Micah reminded them of God's saving acts, how God had liberated them from Egypt. God has been faithful to Israel many times over, and it's time for you to respond in faith. But still, Israel doesn't seem to get it. They still thought they were good, better, and deserved some kind of favor from God, and smirked at the warnings by saying, in this, in this passage, by saying, Say what, God? What do you want, God? Thousands of rams? 10,000 rivers of oil? Maybe what you really want is the death of our firstborn. Will that satisfy you, God? What do we have to do to please you? Say what? If that, that would be kind of dramatic, dramatic reading of today's passage. Now, if I were God at this point, I would just dash them to pieces, right? turn them all to kind of stones for blasphemy, right? Mocking God like that. How dare you would reply to God's faithfulness with such contempt and smirk, or just zap them, right? Good thing I'm not God. <laughs> but God responded with a simple message. God said, just three things are required to reestablish the relationship to bring you out of that deep trouble. Restore your relationship with God. Just three things, Israel. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with your God. Only that, God says. I'm not asking much, Israel. Only this. Only make every facet of your lives, every institution in your communities, every encounter you have with others be defined by justice, by covenant love, and by walk humbly with God. Now suddenly we begin to realize what God really wants, what God really requires from us is not to bring something to God, but to be transformed and to lead a transformed life. What God requires of Israel and of us is much more than something we offer to God, but to transform our lives and to a genuine expression of what a genuine expression of justice, covenant love, and walking humbly with God. And this is the kind of living God expects from his people. God doesn't need thousand rams, ten thousand rivers of oil. I mean, how absurd. 
Our God is not some kind of local, tribal, angry God that demands some kind of religious cultic offering, human sacrifice to appease his anger that we read from some remote, local, primitive, cultic, pagan religion. Our God does not require his people to be more religious, more church-oriented, more building and budget-focused than cultic-oriented religious institutional agendas. God cares very little about big church building, big budget, or big membership in the church. What God cares and requires from all of his people is much more than that. It transforms lives. Doing justice. Doing justice simply means doing what is right in God's eyes. Justice is not about being fair. Johnny Carson once said, if life was fair, Elvis would be alive and all but impersonators would be dead. <laughs> justice isn't about being fair, it's about doing what is right in God's eyes. To do justice is to deliver the oppressed, to clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, feed the hungry, heal the suffering ones, to be with those who have been marginalized, and work to bring them to the equal playing field, to heal, to restore the broken people and the community to the wholeness, doing what is right in God's eyes. Loving kindness is practicing community solidarity. To welcome, to accept, and include everyone regardless of their background. Because we have been made one in a covenant relationship. In a covenant relationship and a community, no one is left out. No one is standing outside looking in. We are all in the circle, all fit together in this human community. Jesus said, love one another. And walking humbly with God. Actor Tom Seller. Anybody know? You know who? Yeah. He once said, Once I get full of myself, I remember the nice elderly couple who approached me when with camera on a street in a Honolulu one day. When I struck a pose for them, the man said, No, no, we want you to take a picture for us. <laughs> Ultimately, walking humbly with God means to give your control over to God. It's as much of our inner attitude as our life action. Understanding that once we have, been, we have entered into the discipleship, we are not ours anymore. We are not in control of our lives. We yield to God. We ask God. We let God lead us. We say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's turn to our second uh, reading today in Matthew chapter 5. Last week I said there are three stages following Jesus, or three types of followers of Jesus, spectators and seekers and disciples. Jesus called his first disciples, and the next thing he does in our New Testament reading from Matthew chapter 5 is to giving them a simple message of what it means to live a life of disciples. He says, this is how I want you to live your life, sort of set of standard of practice for the disciples to live by. This is what I expect and require you to practice as my disciples, which will lead you to truly blessed life, beatitudes, a set of eight practices for disciples. Blessed are poor, blessed are those who are grieving, and peacemakers, and on and on. So if you have some time, I really have to ask you to not only read this over, but do kind of deep reflection on this. All eight blessings are nothing like what we would consider uh, to lead us in blessed and happy life in this world. Because they're just exactly opposite of what we consider to lead us to happiness. I have, once again, I hope I have a time, opportunity in, in the future to do some ministry reason just on the attitude. But for now, I encourage you to reflect upon them. So these are the standards of practice for the disciples of Jesus, for the community of disciples of Jesus Christ. What God wants from us and what God will judge us by isn't how big did you get, 
How well did you worship? How excellent was your church program? But to do what God requires of us, justice, kindness, and humility, and less and other. This is a second movement in the way of disciples.